Hello. Thank you and welcome back to the Fisheries Committee. We've gone through the preview sport fishing proposals and the preview of bait proposals. And I'd like to call on Chief Fist for the preview of commercial fishing proposals. Okay, for the commercial fishing uh, proposal, we have a slightly different uh, public engagement. We, we actually ha have the benefit of working with the Commercial Fishing Advisory Committee, which is chaired by Clay Young. This is a nine-member committee that, that meets with Tennessee Wildlife once a year to talk about uh, commercial fishing regulations in general. And if we have something or they have something we want to talk about, we, we generally do at this meeting. And at this meeting this year, they, they brought three recommendations that all revolved around ways to get at more carp to harvest them. But we're back on Asian carp again, unfortunately. The, uh, the three, just briefly, there are three recommendations. One was to get more time to gill net in creeks on the reservoir in April and May, to uh, open up Camden WMA, and to open a section of the Duck River. And I'll go into these more, in more detail now. First, a little background on this April-May closure deal. The, uh, during the, the months of April and May on, on the reservoirs of the state, commercial fishing is permitted in, in these creeks from one hour after sunset to 5 a.m. So it's a night fishery when they're allowed to have gill nets. They can have other gears in there at, during those hours, but it's the gill nets that create the most conflict. Then the reason this regulation is in, in effect right now is that over the, it, it's been there for many years, it is to resolve an, a, a known conflict for, for using space in these creeks. When you have peak season for crappie and bass fishing in April and May, we wouldn't want people trolling, uh, using spider rigs or whatever with, over a whole bunch of gill nets that are in place. That would create a lot of user conflict that we can avoid with the regulation that we have in place. Now, they, they came to us saying that these creeks are heavily used by Asian carp in, in this time of year, and we're running into problems getting all our gear out of the water because we're handling so many fish and getting out on time. That's what the, the short of that story was. So their recommendation to us was to change this current regulation to allow them to be in there from 6 in the evening to 8 in the morning. And this would create, in our opinion, considerable overlap with current crappie fishing that's going on. We would, we would support a little bit more time. We would, we would like to try just one more hour to see if that makes a difference in them getting their gear together and getting out and getting back to the, the market with their fish. It's not much, but it, it, we, we're willing to try this and see if we can do it without creating conflict. So that's our, that's our recommendation on this one. The next recommendation they had was to open Camden WMA to commercial fishing. Camden WMA is on the Kentucky Lake <coughs> near Highway 70. When the water, when, when it's flooded, it, it could be a, a place to fish. It's also popular with sport fishermen. Uh, the commercial fishermen ask to get access to this. We would support this recommendation as well to get more carp out of there. With, with the current WMA restriction, now there's a group B WMA restrictions that highlights things you can and can't do on WMAs when you're a commercial fisher, and they involve dates to avoid, mostly they're dates to avoid hunting seasons on these areas. So with those restrictions in place, and we would also want to add that recommended restriction from that they don't have gill nets in there between six in the morning and one hour after sunset, similar to what we're proposing for the rest of the creeks on the reservoir. We would give them more opportunity to fish in Camden WMA with this. And lastly, there was a request to open the Duck River from mile 1.4 to mile four going upstream. And this area has been closed for some time. It, 
years ago, it was considered to be important for a striped bass fishery that was in that is in that lake. Uh, paddlefish certainly use that area. We still see it as important habitat for fish, our, our, our fish species in the lake, but we also are aware that, that the uh, Asian carp are using this area a lot. So we're willing to, we, we would recommend that we open this up and watch it and see, see how many carp they really, you know, that make, make sure there's no negative impacts of this recommendation if it is approved. But we, we think we should, we should try to open this area up. And uh, the rest of these recommendations were not recommended by uh, CFAC, but they're things that kind of follow uh, some other requests that we, we had, well, well, that we created by talking about the sport fish. The, the commercial fishermen can harvest live skipjack, threadfin, and gizzard shad, so we feel like they should, be, should fall into the same restriction as sport fishermen, with the exception that we, we would just recommend that they not take these, these species alive ever. I mean, there's, there's no real downside there. Uh, unlike with the sport fishing where we had active sport fishing communities getting a lot out of these fish, the commercial community is saying that they're not even using these as live baits, so we would be pretty comfortable with putting that on there. And they can speak to that on their own but in their comments. But that's what we'd like to do, limit them statewide to be able to take live skipjack, gizzard shad, and threadfin shad. Another recommendation we have is some, uh, some wordplay here. In the current proclamation, commercial gear is prohibited within 1,000 yards of a dam. And the intent there was to make sure people weren't setting commercial tackle within 1,000 yards of the dam. But what happens is if you're trying to use a boat ramp that happens to be near the dam, which is often a very good boat ramp compared to some others on the river, you wouldn't be sure if you could use it. We'd like to change the language to say commercial gear may not be set. This way, it's understood they can't set commercial gear close to the dam, but it is okay for them to use that ramp, which in a lot of cases can save them a lot of miles on the water. And there's really no reason to keep them out as long as we don't have the gill nets or, or other gear set within that area. And last, well not lastly, but another recommendation we have here is uh, to delete two sections from the commercial fishing proclamation. The section two and five, which are relate to licenses and permits and report requirements. These types of things are already covered in the rule that was passed last year, rule 1660-0130. So that, this is already in the books since October. We're just striking this from the current proclamation, and it'll affect, it'll make no change to the the rules and regulations that commercial fishermen follow. It's a housekeeping effort. And we did have some public comment about commercial fishing that was not from commercial fishermen this year, and it's not, which is not unusual. But I wanted to bring this up because I know that. A lot of the commission was copied on some of these emails. We received 13 emails from concerned cat fishermen really across the Midwest. They were, most of the people were out of state, some were in state that wrote to us. They're basically, the gist of their letter was that you have great uh, cat fisheries in, in Tennessee, but we're very concerned that too many fish are being harvested and hauled live to northern lakes. And if, uh, if, if they, they wanted us basically to stop that practice. Okay, so we do not agree that there are too many fish being hauled anywhere. We have no information to support how many fish are going. We, we, see, we see big catfish on the water all the time. We've got way fewer commercial fishermen than we ever had. We're, we're down to in the almost 300 we used to have what, 20 years ago, we had, what, 1,200 or so. They're, they are allowed to harvest one per day over 34 inches, and, and many of them do, but they also catch many others over 34 inches that they're not harvesting. So whether or not these fish are sold live or dead really doesn't matter to the resource at that point. It only matters if it's creating, like, excessive demands where more, more and more people are 
in intensively or purposely chasing bigger catfish. And we just don't see that. I mean, you, you look at uh, commercial fishing boats, they're not geared up to, with big live tanks to haul live fish around. They're, they're, there's viable, profitable markets for big catfish, and that's where these big catfish by and large are going when they're caught by commercial fishermen. So the, the agency has no recommendation to change uh, the, the, the disposition or the krill limit for catfish over 34 inches based on these requests. And that concludes the commercial fishing presentation. Great. Any questions from commission? Commissioner Cox. So in your opinion, uh, the commercial fishermen are not taking these fish out of state, which y'all can tell. Live fish. Not, not in great numbers. So, so if we had a restriction of about fish over 34 inches being exported live, you would think that wouldn't be a, that wouldn't cause a disturbance? Well, mentioning exporting and importing would be a little more challenging for me to address, but just the idea of whether or not a fish is alive or dead when it's taken from the river uh, would would fall in line with the existing regulation we have. It, it doesn't it doesn't matter to the to who to the population that's left whether or not that fish is killed immediately or killed later. That didn't answer my question. My question is, if the commercial fishermen are not selling these and exporting them to pay lakes in Ohio, Kentucky, Missouri, wherever they are, if that's not what's happening and they've denied doing that, then then having an, a ban on exporting fish over 34 inches is not going to meet any resistance from the commercial fishermen, in your opinion? Uh, the commercial fishermen would have to answer that question on okay. their own. That, but but I, don't, I don't think it's fair to assume, make those assumptions along the way in the question that they are a lot of them going up there. We don't, we don't think there's, there, there's probably some, I'm not going to say there's no fish that ever go to Ohio from Tennessee, that would be a legal sale. We're just not aware of it happening often enough that it would matter. And again, we're looking at our catfish populations in commercially fished waters, and they're doing fine. Any other questions from commission? I'd like to take the opportunity to invite members of the public to give comment. And Mr. Clay Young with the Commercial Fishing Advisory Council. To recognize you first yes uh, I want to speak on the catfish there first uh, <clears throat> I've spoken to most of my commercial fishermen and most of the guys on the Mississippi River <laughs> we are not opposed to get that like a over 34 has to be dead because it's like a shadow that's you know been on us for years and there's a couple guys that haul fish out of uh, Tennessee to Kentucky or Missouri or something like that. And uh, I can't speak for all the commercial fishermen, but a pretty good percentage, we wouldn't be opposed to like a law, you know, 34 and over has to be, uh, can't be hauled alive. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Commissioner King. Uh, but wasn't there something that was brought up about it might affect catfish tournaments? Well, at, at, one, at one point there was discussion about if we were to ban all movement of live catfish over 34 inches, that would affect sport fishing tournaments. Mm -hmm. We're only talking about the commercial uh, catfish harvest at this time. And I'm not, we're not bringing a proposal that would affect sport fishermen. Any other questions? Okay, with that, um, we'll go to the preview of mussel proposals. Okay, this, this proclamation uh, recommendation is uh, completely housekeeping items. In the last, la last year, we moved sections five, six, and seven from the uh, proclamation or we, we actually created a rule that in, that covers sections five six and seven that's that rule 1660 31 and it's been in place since october of 17 
So all we would like to do is remove these sections from the current proclamation because they're already addressed in rule and it will make no changes for the industry at all or anyone involved in muscle work. And that concludes the muscle presentation. Any questions? Okay, thank you. I really appreciate it, Frank. Uh, any comments from the public on the muscle preview? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. With that, Mr. Chairman, that concludes the Fisheries Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Woodson. I'd like to recognize Chairman Box with the Voting and Law Enforcement Committee. Uh, thank you, Chairman Box. Thank you, Scotty. Uh, this next slide, I just, man, I'm going to get in trouble. I know it, but I, I couldn't resist. I added that during the break. And what you're looking at here is a 32-year quest that was conquered last month. I've been trying to catch a 20-inch smallmouth in my creeks around the house, and I caught one last month. So I paid my $5 and got my TARP award, and life is good. <laughs> So, down to business. Uh, this is a request, uh, Proclamation 1814, to temporarily suspend a no-weight zone that's on Nickajack Reservoir, and in particular, it's the no-weight zone at the Marion County Park. And these dates are for October 12th, 13th, and 14th, and it's to hold the outdoor drag boat race. Uh, this request has been coming forward to this commission since 2008, and it's been approved every year. And this temporary suspension is for 10 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. each day. And it's granted for the participants and the officials of the uh, Outdoor Drag Boat Association. And I'll take any questions. Great. Any questions from commission? Public? Right, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. <laughs> Okay, uh, all in favor of passing? I'll make, a, I'll make a motion for the past proclamation 18-14. Second. Great. Okay. Motion passed. No, all, in favor. all in favor. I'm here today. It's fine. <laughs> Everything's good. All in favor? Uh. <laughs> Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Box. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I'd like to recognize Chairman Sanders for the Budget Committee. Thank you, Chairman. I want to uh, ask Michael May to step up, the Assistant Chief or Assistant Director of Staff Operations. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Chairman Sanders, Commission. I'm here to introduce Rob Southwick, who will perform a statistical analysis of our license structure over the next several months. But first, uh, a little bit of background information. As you all know, obviously, we've been in, very interested with the commission and the agency to have a better understanding of our license structure in an effort to optimize sales and increase revenue. In particular, um, there's interest in reviewing lifetime license and price points along with current license sales or current license structure. And if we're, you know, charging over or under optimum uh, price points, and also to determine new license types and potential combos and price points for those as well that potential for the public would be interested in purchasing. Um, because of this, we reached out to Rob Southwick. And Rob owns, a little bit of background on him, Rob owns Southwick Associates, well, obviously named, uh, and is well-renowned nationally both in our community across the nation and business communities as a leader in market research, statistics, and economics specializing in fishing, hunting, and shooting, and outdoor recreation. Since 1990, Southwick Associates has delivered comprehensive quantitative insights for state resource agencies, industry, and nonprofit sportsmen conservation organizations. They were first to develop statistical assessments of state license sales and prices 
uh, specifically in 1999 with Vermont. Uh, since then, they have helped approximately 40 states better understand if their license prices are too high or too low, and if different types of license types uh, might better serve hunters and anglers while enhancing the state's license revenue. So TWA recently entered into contract with Southwick and Associates to accomplish the following objectives through a three-phased approach. Determine optimal pricing for current license types, determine, op determine optimal lifetime license pricing, and identify new license types and combos to increase sales and revenue potential. Uh, having said that, it's my pleasure to introduce Rob Southwick. All right, thank you. I appreciate the introduction. It's organized here. A um, little quick background, it's not just me. I have 12 people back in the office, a whole lot smarter than I am, more than the number jocks. Um, they did most of the heavy lifting. So my job is to really kind of be the interpreter, the one to make sure that, is, I think our, my specialty especially is having to work with state agencies since it began the business in 1990, and before that actually. So I really think we've got a strong grounding in what the issues are that state agencies have to face. Um, work with the constituents, revenue challenges, when it's time to think like a business, because you're, you're trying to raise revenue with, with licenses. Um, so, and you have to balance it. But you can't act like a business, because a business can tell people to take a hike, and you still have to serve everybody, and you have to listen to everyone. So we understand a lot of the conflicts, and that's my job. Then I'll go back to the office with this feedback, work with staff, and try to bring forward the best solutions, and then work with you all to, to implement it. Um, based out of North Florida, but our work is all over the U.S. We actually do a lot of work with other agencies and more developing, and countries trying to develop their wildlife resources, too. So I want to start here, as, as Michael had mentioned, the work, um, this project is really designed to try to find new ways to increase license revenues fairly, and with the word optimize, I'll come back to that in a minute. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty technical detail, that would be a snooze fest. Uh, my training is in economics, and nobody likes long-winded economists. Um, I can pull out the supply and demand graphs, but only when the audience is unruly, but I don't think it's going to happen today. But if you have questions, please cut me off and um, ask, otherwise at the end I have time for questions at the end, and let's just jump right into it. So the three major objectives um, that we're trying to accomplish here, number one is to identify what are the best prices for lifetime licenses, um, to make sure that we're not shortchanging the future when it comes to collecting revenue that you're gonna have to hopefully borrow upon in the long run. I know there's some short-term issues in how those dollars are managed, but we're trying to make sure that when the funds do come in, you can draw on them during the lifetime of that, of that customer. Um, also, we're going to talk about optimizing license prices because it's not maximizing revenue because I can give you the price points on where you can actually maximize your revenue, but we have to look at the trade-off between SFR dollars, um, the PRDJ funds, and also public. And whenever you raise prices, you're going to lose a few customers, and you have to figure out where's that maximum or the ideal, the optimal balance point between revenues and making sure you get the SFR, the DJ funds, and of course keeping your customers. And thirdly, we're going to look at new types of licenses. And this is kind of a newer methodology that's been employed in the last five or six years with state agencies. And this one's kind of interesting. So I'm going to go through these objectives, really talking about three phases. They don't perfectly line up with the three objectives, but very closely. But explaining what we're doing now for the agency, I think you'll understand the approach and what you're going to get out of it. And that's really my goal here is for you to understand what is coming. Um, so when the results land, you can understand it better. And if you have any questions or concerns, we can address them now in the project to make sure, because you all be making a lot of these decisions, I need to make sure we're providing you the information that makes sense. Um, so task number one, uh, phase one actually, is three phases. Phase one has two different tasks in there. The first task is we're going to look at churn rates. Churn rates basically acknowledges that you may have a pool of customers, people who buy hunting fishing licenses this big. And they could buy it maybe just over a 10-year period. But any given year, a lot of them don't. So your actual buyers annually might be this big. So the churn rate is those people that drop out every year. Some may come back. Some may not. Some may come back a few years later. A few new ones come in there. But we're churning through this bigger pool of customers to every year have this many customers actually buy a license. So what we want to do is reduce that churn rate, help people renew their licenses more often. So that's what we wanted to examine here in phase one. So again, I do have churn rates, but also combinations. Because a lot of new licenses that you could sell are really combinations of existing privileges that are available. I mean, you have the basic license you have to buy in Tennessee, hunt and fishing license, and then you buy your supplements on top of that. Now, whether it's your general firearm, your archery, your muzzleloader, 
And we can, we're looking at the data now to see what combinations people tend to buy on their own. That indicates where interest might be for a new type of licensed product. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes too about how that can, this process can identify new licenses. And the reason why we're doing this is because phase three, which we'll talk about in a couple of moments, is we're gonna start considering new types of licenses. We're gonna go out and talk to customers and see what kind of licenses they would like. And we're gonna work with staff ahead of time to identify what they've heard talking, working with the customers on a daily basis, what new types of licenses might be of interest that could generate greater revenue, provide a greater value to the consumer, and therefore you can charge a higher price. And so that will come down later, but we have to give people time to chew through the results before we get to phase three. So we're doing that up front. And then the second part of phase one is looking at the lifetime licenses. Because it's a kind of a three-way decision with lifetime licenses. If you charge too little, you're gonna sell a lot of them, and then you're not gonna have that money invested and save for down the road, say 10, 20, 30 years down the road, you gotta draw upon that to manage conservation. Yet if you price it too high, you're not gonna sell very many of them, you're not gonna build up that, that war chest. Also, a lot of people who buy lifetime licenses or haven't bought for them, usually when they're young, are never gonna hunt and fish. A lot of them end up moving out of state or don't have an interest in them. So you don't wanna price it too high either, so you don't, it's great to sell licenses to people who aren't using in a sense, it's just, pure revenue. And so we have to consider all these different things happening. And we'll be doing that as part of the lifetime license phase. Um, and so the procedures we're using here are just straightforward uh, standards, statistical methods. And the lifetime licenses will be looking at present value, future value terms, because get that churn rate. We know that not everybody buys a license every year, but we know from the license data, typically out of a 10 year period, every decade of your life, how often people typically fish. So that rate of usage has got to go into the calculation to get that fairly priced license. Again, this is a little on the technical side, but that'll be in the final report how we do it. Um, now we finished the first part, looking at the churn rates and the combinations. I want to share with you some initial results, and no one's seen these yet, because I just saw them yesterday for the first time. Um, but it's interesting, it gives you an idea of where we're going with, with trying to design new types of licenses for your customers and revenues. We know that Based on the data, we, it's not a survey, but we have license, every license transaction last 10 years we have in the computer, and we know that this year, 25% of your licensed buyers this year will not buy a license next year. So we're having this churn rate. So one out of four customers are not gonna participate next year. And this is often surprising for people like us because we live, we think hunting, fishing all the time. We come to these meetings about it. It's top of mind. But a lot of our consumers are easily swayed by another activity. Now you're joining a sports league, kids get involved in new activity, their buddies committed them to, to going camping without rod and reel. So things happen. So we gotta take care of that. What's interesting though, the good news is that in Tennessee, five or six years ago, your churn rate was a lot higher. And most states, that it, it doesn't move very much. This is a good thing. And first of all, well, I'll applaud you all for hiring Brandt. That's what we see the solution. We saw this in Georgia's license data. We've seen it in Florida's license data. They're very aggressive on encouraging people to buy that license, to renew the license. They have the auto renewal feature going on. I talked with staff. There's really nothing else going on that's major. There are some good R3 activities going on, but this is probably the single biggest thing, and it matches what we've seen in other states. Sir? What's an average state? What, what, what do you see in your average state? What's the churn rate? Around 35%. So you're still better than that. And it's higher. Um, hunters have lower churn rates. They're more vested, whether it's access to the land, the equipment. Anglers have typically a 50% churn rate. So it varies because it's easier to get in and out of fishing. When you hunt, you got to make the commitment, you're in. Um, but back to the churn rates. The churn rates really gets concerning when you look at it over time. So over a three-year period, you can expect half of your customers will buy or not buy a license in three out of three years. So half of them will buy three out of three. The other half are only going to buy once or twice. So we're starting to lose money here because you know, if they drop out for a year, we don't get, get the license revenue. When you look at five years, basically a third of our customers buy a license every five years. And that's where it gets surprising for people in the room here because, again, we live it. We think about it. We have reminders to go every year. Most of our customers do not. And that's a clue for future marketing approaches. Got to keep reminding people year-round, not a month before season starts when they've already made their decision. Brant's really good about that. And no, Brant's not paying us for this project, but we're impressed by what they've done in other states. Uh, we do monitor licenses in the states they work in. So that's the churn rate. So the first message in the churn rate is time to start thinking about multi-year licenses, time to start getting more aggressive about renewals, the auto renewal program, getting people to sign up for it, see the benefit of it. Most states we've gone to, people are fine with that. 
But I think that's going to be one thing we're going to be testing in phase three or multi-year licenses. The combinations, again, Tennessee is a little bit different because you have that base license, that base hunting fishing license, and you buy your supplements on top of that. So if you look at the, for the hunting side, the big game, the base license plus the three major supplementals, the, the general firearm, or if you call it the gun supplement, archery and muzzleloader, only 7% of your customers are buying that package. Yes, a lot of them might just buy the sportsman's license, that gives you the WMA pr privileges and the non-quota, but still only a smaller percentage of your customers are using WMA. Um, on top of that, we know 61% of your customers don't buy any supplements. Yes, a lot of those are anglers, not trout fishermen, but I bet you a good third to a half of those are hunting also. And so a lot of them have interest, they just, have, they just do the same thing year out of year, out of habit. And so what we've seen in other states is if you can have some combination licenses that the face value for buying all three supplements with the base is $136. Possibly offer a combination license that puts all that together in one, maybe make it a multi-year license, give them a slight discount, five or six percent. We'll come back to that. That's an important consideration in a minute. And you can sell a lot more of those. So now people are buying greater privileges because it gives them flexibility to go in the last, the last minute. You're capturing the larger amount of revenue and it's their free choice. They can still buy the same license they've always bought, but they're deciding to pay more, you get more, it's a win-win. So we're gonna test those examples too in phase three. So that's kind of the initial examples we have now, and then for the agency, we'll be packaging all those and getting those to you to start chewing through before we sit down and do our brainstorming for phase three. Phase two is the price, is the point where we're gonna start looking at your current licenses. Um, I'll go out a little bit in a limb. I do not mean to be insulting any way whatsoever, but working with state agencies on, on licenses, you charge these prices because you always have. And then from time to time, you think, hey, we need more revenue. We need to raise our prices. Okay, let's raise our prices 10% across the board. It doesn't work very well that way. So what, what typically happens here is that um, when you do something like that, and I'm using 10% across the board, because that seems to be the standard that many states do, it fails to identify that not every license can withstand a price hike. Sometimes you've jacked the prices up too high, people say, too much for me, I'm gonna dumb down to a lower price license. You lost, you didn't make money in that one. Often your license price is on a bell curve. I think a lot of you are probably in private business, you know at some point you can keep raising your prices and make more money. At some point you've gone too far. And a lot of our licenses are already at top of that bell curve, especially our non-resident licenses. And I'm suspecting, my hypothesis, that's the case here in Tennessee looking at non-resident prices. And at that point, you make more money by lowering your prices. So if you really want to have an effective price hike and take the political pain that comes with it, you need to look at each and every license and find those licenses that can withstand a hike and find those licenses that cannot and act accordingly. Because the public will punish you. Again, they, don't have, they don't have to hunt and fish. They can go do something else. So you've got to look at the price and see when they're going to push back on you. And that's what we'll be doing on, so each individual license, we also look at the trade-off between licenses because people will step down. But sometimes too, we actually studied there in Tennessee some 15 years ago, I think, when you raise the prices up to a certain point, people will step up because that marginal difference is not that great between your two higher price licenses. So that's kind of the quick version. There's more to it than that, but that's how it typically goes. So we'll look at that, and then we'll come back with information. We put it into a model, a spreadsheet. You can play what-if games and say, if we change these licenses and left these alone, what's the net revenue effect? And it also considers the PRDJ effects, the, the license, the extra revenues from the feds there. Um, the whole thing is based on what we call regression models, multivariate models. Basically, it's not a survey. It looks at, in the past, 20 years back, how do people trade off how do your license sales vary based on price changes, how do people react to it, and other factors such as weather and economy and new regulatory changes. So it's a good process. I can explain that later to you if you want. But the third part is really, I think, where your best opportunity will come to boost license revenues in a way that the public generally accepts the best. And this is looking at new types of licenses you don't offer now, but maybe the public wants. This is where we're going to take the information from phase one and start considering what types of license to test. There's not a single business out there that will go 20, 30 years and sell the same product. You're going to bring new products in there from time to time. Not saying people get excited about new types of licenses, but to a degree they will. If you can offer a license that has different sets of privileges than you offer now that they like, yeah, they get excited. They'll pay more for it. That's a good thing. It's a voluntary purchase. You're getting more money. And so we'll be testing a lot of that. Um, 
can go through a little bit more. This process, let me just skip ahead a little bit, because really the way this thing works is that we would call it conjoint survey. And don't worry about the name so much. This is a process that's actually developed um, by the breakfast cereal industry back in the 70s. And it's kind of interesting to tie breakfast cereal to fishing and hunting. What they knew back then is that the customer walks into the store, and you've all been in this situation, you walk into the store, and you've got this huge long aisle of breakfast cereals. And for some reason, you're looking at all these different choices, and you're like, I'm taking that one. And you buy it, and you go home. Well, why did you pick that one versus all these other choices there? I mean, there's still cereal. It's kind of ground air, cooked wheat or something. But they learned that there's, you really don't buy a product. You're buying a bundle of features. And that's what breakfast cereal is. It's everything from the color of the box, to the image in the box, the flavor of the cereal, the color of the cereal, the size of the box, the price, the brand, where it sits on the shelf. And your mind processes all this. And it causes you to decide, I'm buying this one versus that one. The key factor being what the price is versus the features and the benefits you get out of it. And this is now something that we use for many products. Actually, our company, we use it to help design new firearms. For actually, the best-selling handgun five years ago came off the process. Top-selling fishing line three years ago came off of doing this process. And we're doing it right now for some sites. This, um, sales are so far, they're going up really well. So the point is, is you t the conjoint surveys is kind of an advanced survey process where we're going to take all these new ideas of licenses and put it into a survey as a simulated shopping experience for the person taking the survey. And we're going to, so you, so let's say if you took the survey, you might see five different licenses offered to you. One, the one you bought last year, so you can still purchase that one if you want. You may have two that are brand new, never seen before. You may have another two that are, are other choices you have now. And we'll put prices on there. And you choose which one you would buy if you had to buy a new license now. And we'll ask you another, scenario, another set of five licenses and see how you trade off of it. But we may have 100 different types of licenses to choose from at five price points each. So you can't see all of them. You quit that survey in a heartbeat. You wouldn't take that. But we're going to run this survey to probably about 5,000, 6,000 people off the license database. So at that point, you can see how people are trading between different licenses at different prices and statistically, we can identify optimal prices, what's the best price for a new license, and would people give up certain licenses for some of these new ideas. So when it's done, we can rank all these out, show you what the prices are, show you what the optimal discounts are. It's not 25%. Typically, states love just 20 25%. Usually, it's on 4 to 5% when people really respond to something. And then you can decide which licenses you want to keep, which licenses may be best to put away, and these new ones, which ones you want to introduce? Because the customers have told us in the survey process what they would like to see. And to me, that's the, um, so I think this little button right here, if that works. Yeah, it does. It's pretty cool. Right, uh, this one right here. Customers in the decision-making process. Because when you go to the legislature, you can tell them. This is not government telling the constituents what they have to buy. This is the customers telling us what they want to buy from us. And so it's, it's a solid process. Now, it is a survey. Every survey has a level of error into it. This one here, because you have so many people, you can you very high sample sizes. But we are surveying license holders. It's not the general public. All right, so it's, it's easy to get. We know exactly who they are. We can draw samples that re perfectly represent every license holder in the state. When the survey is done, we can see who responded and see which segments of your customers are missing or underrepresented and weight them, balance them accordingly, keep them in there. What's best about this survey is if you go out and run a straight survey and just ask people, how much would you pay for this license? They're going to lowball you. They're going to say, you know, I want it for free. You know, five bucks. You know, it's gaming. That's normal strategic bias, we call that. And so this survey here doesn't allow that because the, the bidding process, you're given choices at fixed prices. And you dictate, you say, I'd rather have this one over that one. Because this one may cost 10 bucks more. But I'm going to get a whole lot more benefit and privilege out of it. So this kind of process minimizes the biases in there. So that's kind of the highlights. Um, again, I don't want to kill you on the details, but you now know what's coming forward, the approach we're taking to it. I think it's key to understand that we're going to look at current licenses and see what kind of prices you could charge. You all decide eventually. So you can still offer those if you want. We're going to come back to you and say, here's some new license ideas. Could be multi-year, could be combos, could be multi-year combos. You could have some add-ons that, you know, free hat and vanity bumper stickers. People love that. They pay a lot extra for that sort of thing. Um, and other types of options in there. So you can decide what's the best way. So wrapping it up, the last point I want to make, I apologize for kind of talking fast, but I know it's getting kind of late in the meeting and 
um, again, long-winded economists are pretty pretty bad. The key thing is, I know your long-term mission is, of course, to maintain revenues, enhance revenues for conservation investments. This is just a part of the answer. R3, of course, is another critical part of it. We've got to keep recruiting our customers. Good licenses help retain them, helps keep them involved, keep them engaged. But this process is a big part of your answer, but you still have to address the R3. So it's not a magic bullet, but we want to be a part of the solution you're looking for. So with that, I'll kind of hush up, and if you all have any questions, um, please let me know. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate that. Uh, any questions? And for this part, I'll go ahead and open it up to the entire commission, since uh, I believe you're only here today. So. Yes. I didn't beat you that that much. So, are uh, are you going to present a proposal to the agency to do this work for us, or are we already down the road on we're that? Already, we're already started. We're already midway through phase one, just starting into the license, lifetime license analysis right Great. now. Thank you. Thank you. What's your timeline on this for, for us when you um, come back to us? What's have everything said and done by middle of 2019. June 2019 is end of the contract. Phase one, we should have done in about two to three weeks. Phase two, which is the optim looking at current license prices, we're targeting around the end of the year. And then the first six months of next year is when we'll do the, the fancy dancy conjoint survey. And you've done this for other states and so forth? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This specific situation? Yes, exactly. Actually, we have three other states going on right now, uh, Connecticut, um, West Virginia, and Idaho. We're doing okay. the same thing now. When you do your research, and I, was, you, I know you were, when you were doing Oklahoma. your presentation, there's a lot of research that you're dealing with outside of what we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Like the cereal and those kind of things. Do you do that research, or do you get the research from another uh, Entity that comes to you. Oh, no, no, we do it all. We don't we don't do breakfast cereal. That's where this whole methodology came from We do this kind of work um, We've done for we can't say exact names of the companies It's confidential, but we've done it for handgun companies I just flew here from Wisconsin for a fishing tackle company. We do it for for hunting and fishing. So it's in-house But oh, yeah, yeah, okay definitely run the surveys in-house data is kept confidential in-house all the analysis in-house okay. Again, by those troll people who are smarter than me <laughs> Rob, I'm assuming um, since state funding is varies from state to state, that gets factored into the process and the license cost and things as you're looking at that, or it, do you get into that that deep of the detail? No, you're talking about alternative funding, say like state appropriations or excise tax or um, sales tax stuff. In this process, no, we've done that for other projects, but for this project, this is strictly about how the consumer will react to what you as an agency are offering in the way of licenses. So blinders to everything else. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Right. Rob, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. At this time, I'd like to call Director Ed Carter to the podium, microphone, displays, stand. Stand. I'm not sure I like that word. Stand. Thank you, Chairman Sanders. <clears throat> Before I get into the budget part, which is where we're headed here in a second, I'd just like to acknowledge that I've worked with Rob Southwick and his company for, I don't know, many years through the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies and through the Southeastern Association. Uh, I'm always amazed at the quality of his work and the number of states and federal agencies that he contacts and works with and, and the integrity of the findings that he has as we go forward. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to the time when we can really use that, Rob, to see where we're going with some of these things. And needless to say, all those things certainly spill into the budget process and the money is what this is all about <clears throat> and how we spend it and where we spend it. We, uh, last Friday, overnighted uh, these books to you and this is essentially all the detail that we put together for this budget for budget year 1920. So we're currently in 1819, obviously. We're looking at 1920, which would start in July the 1st of 19. So putting these things together is quite a chore. And uh, this kind of would remind you that there are about 11 different funds that we're working with. There's a, at least two federal agencies, sometimes more, but on the, on the norm, it's two federal agencies. Um, a whole bunch of different subsets of each one of the federal funds that we work with and things that can be used for, can't be used for. 
<clears throat> different matches and that and it just goes on and on. So there's a lot of, of minutia that goes into these and, and I understand and, and looking through this book it, 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 you were probably overwhelmed at the detail. I know this is not the first budget that y'all have seen so it's very similar to what we've done in the past and putting it together. We try to have our budget to you at this August meeting, the Finance Administration, the Department of Finance Administration, ask us to have it to them in September. So we generally try to go through this, this budget preparation for you to have ours ready for them by the end of next month. As we have in, in normal years, we've, we've looked at a whole bunch of different things. One of the things that, that you will probably notice that it, we have expansions in this year's budget, and uh, I know we come to you in a lot of different budget meetings and ask you to expand our budget for different reasons. They're usually associated with in income that we didn't know that we were going to get at any one particular time. Something that's unanticipated, something breaks and we have to fix it. We didn't have a current enough money in our current budget to do it, all those kind of things. So the expansions that, that we have here are a little bit different in some ways, but I'll tell you that when we get into those expansions in a little more detail, some of the larger items in the expansions, there's a there's million dollars in Americans with Disabilities Compliance Projects, $3 million in land acquisition, primarily on the Cumberland Plateau, $4.4 million in grants for shooting ranges and partner programs and so forth, $1.4 million in equipment, that's five vehicles, 10 bulldozers and a number of tractors, and of that $12.7 million that we would be asking for in expansions, only $321,000 of that is actually license dollars. We always try to present the budget in, in a comparison of three years, that being the year we just closed, and I'll say that, I'll put that in parentheses, actually we won't close these books on the year that ended June the 30th until January of this next year. So. It takes a long time to get the books actually closed, so we're working on the best information we have at any one time. And I know that sometimes presents a little bit of a struggle for us as well as you in trying to figure out exactly where we are at any one time. But we do look at those three, but the 17-18 the year, 18-19, which is where we are now, and the 19-20. So if you're looking in your, in your book, we debated on what color book this was. I'll just tell you, it's this pinkish looking one that I was talking about earlier. Some people thought it was salmon, some thought it was muted pink. It was, but anyway, that budget book, if you look in page one, two, and three is where I want to start, and it's the three-year comparison. On page one, it, you might remember that our agency is required by law to keep our boating funds and our wildlife funds separate. We cannot use boating funds to fund any wildlife program or no wildlife programs to fund anything in boating. We obviously have people who are immersed well, I shouldn't have said immersed in the boating program, but, <laughs> but we, we do have people that are very much involved in both programs, and as we, as we go through that, it takes a heck of a bookkeeping system to know that when you work four hours of a 12-hour day, how much of it gets charged to each one of those particular programs. In each one of our budgets, there are 25 line items in each project. We have about 450 projects. We take each of those 450 projects through our budget cycle, which takes in our review, that is, and it takes us a little over th three weeks to a month to actually go through each of those. We go through it with each division and, and look at where they are compared to where they have been over the last three years in spending. In other words, we do a pretty in-depth analysis of what we just finished, and then we look at what needs they have and either in expansions to the year that we're in or things that we would call improvements. And improvements are those things that in the 1920 year, that would be above the baseline that we've had. So when somebody comes in with a budget, any you, you pick the division, any division comes in, they have a baseline, and that baseline's based on what they had the year before. So we take that baseline, we say, here's your budget, tell us what you need. And they come in with that, and we analyze that. Then we know that at some point there'll be other charges that those divisions have no control over. Uh, costs that come in from other state agencies, changes that will be uh, in federal aid, depending on how that's up or down. And then we also have the parts of, of their analysis that deal with, with uh, employee raises, health benefits, and so forth. So we never know what those are until later on in the game. So em employee benefits includes, of course, retirements and sick leave and, and uh, health and health insurance and all those things. So we have to figure all those things in. So I'll go through this fairly quickly, which 
it's kind of like Rob, a lot of y'all I'm sure would want me to go through this fairly quickly, but I also know that it's very detailed and you probably have a lot of questions, so please yell at me at any time and I'll, let me change that. Please just interrupt me at any time and I'll be glad to try to address that question as best I can. But on page one, again reminding you we have to keep our budget separately. So we have an agency budget, we have a wildlife budget, and we have a boating budget. So this first one is the combination of boating and wildlife put together. If you look at the 2017-18 column, that's not the budget for that year. That's what was actually spent in each of those categories. So when you go down to the bottom, you see of, of that first column, I probably have a slide here somewhere yeah. so that everybody else can follow along. There's this a column on the, on the left-hand side, 1718, $87,138,587 was the amount spent in that year. The budget for that year was actually $113 million. So we had $113 million budgeted, we spent 87. million. That's pretty traditional. We generally spend around 75 to 78 percent of whatever our budget is in any one particular year. So underneath each of those columns, and if you, again, going down to the bottom of the page, it says funding sources. And those funding sources are not the amount of money in each of those columns, it's the amount of money that will fund the programs above it. So look at license registration. All of those things that, are, that occurred in 1718 from license and registration, $445,440,000 of money came from that code. And as you go down this, this page, you can see reserve, and reserve, of course, means license dollars. That's the amount of money, not in our reserve, but that's the amount of money we took out of our license dollars that is, is an enrolling account that stays in there every year. Anything we don't spend goes back into the account. Anything that we bring in goes into that account if it's license dollars. So those license dollars are what we call our reserve that's left over. So in 1718, we took $2.3 million from those reserve funds to fund the program. In any one year, you also have a number of projects that are approved but are unfinished. And there are a number of those in this year. So we use the, our term as carry forwards, that is, those things that the commission has already approved that were in last year's budget, we didn't get them finished, we would just move those forward. You, you actually don't have to take any action on those because you've already approved them. We want to make sure that you understand what the budget is and, and where that money is going and where it comes from. So of these programs we had last year, there are $12.7 million in carry forward projects that would be added in to what our current baseline would have been, which brings the center column, if you're looking at, to $12.7 million, I mean, to, excuse me, to $121 million, which includes the $12.7 million in carry forwards that you've already approved. If you go down to the, to the again, to the reserve account, in the staying in the same column on 1819, it's showing that we would take $10,594,000 out of the reserve to fund those programs above. I'll stop by telling you that there's a difference between the columns. The one on the left is money actually spent. In the state system, everything that you do has to be in the budget before you can address it. So all positions have to be funded. All contracts have to be funded to the maximum amount. Everything that you're going to do in that year has to show up in your budget at that full amount. And so that automatically means that all those things that are in there, we know they're not going to get spent. We know that probably 75 to 77 percent of that budget is going to get spent in any one particular year, including those things that we're carrying forward. Some things like the building that we just finished. The building was carried forward four different years because we would draw a little bit of it off one year, a little bit off the next year until we finally completed the project. But under, again, the state system, if you don't have money in your budget, you can't go forward with any contract. So hope that's making sense that everything's in there. So the big difference between the one on the left and the one on the right is that that center column contains every project that we have, all 450, all funded at their maximum amount. And I realize if you came to the budget committee meeting the other day and, and we're telling you that we're going to probably put money into our reserve account at the end of this year, at the end of 1819, 
you're probably thinking that's one heck of a turnaround from putting money into taking 12.7 out. Uh, I still feel personally pretty confident that we're going to put money into our reserve at the end of this year. And one of the reasons is because of, of during those expansion projects that I mentioned earlier, about $5.7 million of those will come back into our reserve off of those expansions. And I'll explain that a little bit more in a second. But to stay with my program here, the uh, 10.5 million that say we're taking out of the reserve, I just mentioned to you that in fiscal year 1617, under the same scenario, we said that we would be taking money out of our reserve, and in fact, we added 6.9 million to the reserve. In 1718, we said that we would take out 11.2 million dollars. We actually took out 2.3. In 1819, it says that we will take out 2 million, in in our estimation. Uh, we actually believe, I actually believe, and I think most of the staff does, that we'll actually put money in. I'm sorry, James. You oh, yeah. So in any case, 1920, we're, our estimate is that we will take about $3 million out of the reserve in 1920, but way too early to tell. It could be, there's so many factors, how much federal money we get in, how much we have to use, and so forth. And just depending on how many grants we get and what the money's used for, what we match it with. And in the state system, sometimes there's a misunderstanding when people say, well, you got $30 million in federal aid. We did, but we have to spend $30 million to get reimbursed anything that comes out of that federal aid. You have to spend it to get it back. And we get reimbursed on a percentage, and that varies from almost nothing to, to sometimes to 100%. Most of it to 75, 25. There are few, few that are 65, 35, and, and on and on. Moving over to the right-hand column, you'll note that the amount that we're asking for you to consider for the fiscal year 1920 would be $93,684,000. is, as you can see, about 6.6 .6 million more than we had in 1718, the amount that we actually spent in 1718. And if you go to the very top, I want to point out a thing that I think is fairly important. On the right-hand column, we're showing we spent 1718. In 1718, we spent $54 million on employees for salary benefits and so forth. And it's showing in 1920, 60830000 million. I just want to assure you that there are not $5 million worth of raises there. It's actually $1.3 million worth of raises, and there's 227000 in extra benefit charges for employee insurance and that. So automatically, that makes that $60 million way above what we know that we will actually be asking for so or what we'll actually be spending. So there, there are a lot of things that we have to put into our budget because we're required to under the state system. That is... That is more than all the positions we have put together. That's that's about four and a half million dollars more in employee salaries than we have in in the number of employees that we have now. So they they tell us to put that much money in, and that's a requirement they they put to us. Doesn't mean we will spend it, and it doesn't mean it's actually figures that we think will be figured into how much money comes or goes at the end of the year. Dumb yes, sir. question. Sorry, but. You're asking so you don't, person. you don't. So where does the money go that's not spent? Does it, it come, is, does it fold back in? It does. It is, goes back in. It's our not the carry. For, is that called a carry forward? Because there are only there's projects that are carry forwards, right? Exactly. Okay. So in any case, to back over to the right hand column there, where we'd be asking for ninety three million six hundred eighty four thousand two hundred dollars in in that year to go forward. That's in the entire agency budget. And I, I know you'll probably have some questions here, but let me move over for a second to the, to the page two, which is the wildlife budget. <clears throat> I won't go into the same detail on this one. I'll just tell you that this is the breakdown under the wildlife funding thing that's both the revenue and expenditures that's strictly wildlife. There's no boating in this, no other programs other than those that are associated with wildlife programs in our agency. It also includes all the federal aid for those particular programs that we can grow down from Hunter Education, Pittman Robinson, and so forth. So that's the three-year comparison on just wildlife, if you, if you want to make that same comparison there. Flipping to the third page is our boating fund. And again, 
you have the same comparison that that you did on the entire agency budget on the wildlife budget. I will tell you that the boating fund is the one that we're most concerned with in the immediate future. The reserve fund in boating is is pretty low. Uh, the marine fuel tax that, <clears throat> let, let, excuse me, <clears throat> the marine fuel tax that the legislature graciously allowed us to start using this last year is making a heck of a difference in keeping that that program going. But like the legislature and like you, I'm sure we don't want to use all that money just to shore up the amount of money that comes into the boating program. There are many other uses we can use it for anything that's water related or at least projects on the water from, from boating safety, enforcement safety, fishing piers and all those kind of things. So there's the three years in comparison. What I wanted to mention to you about the expansion funding, and this is not a slide I have for you, but and it's broken out in your book in more detail, but the, the, quick, res the quick return on that, the expansions, I told you that we had the amount of money, about $12 million worth of expansions, only 321000 is coming out of the reserve. But I also wanted to mention to you that I picked out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine different projects <clears throat> where we will utilize some other source of funding and then be able to draw down federal aid money to reimburse us. So for instance, on a lot of our projects, I'll use Cheatham Waterfowl area since it's close. The $800,000 worth of pumps that we've had to put in out there. And to do that, it's eligible to utilize a different fund that has state money in it. So we utilize that fund, we'll push that into the, to the Fish and Wildlife Service and, and result, we would get $600,000 of essentially license money back into our reserve. So of those nine projects that we've picked out, it will return about $5.7 million back into our reserve as a part of those expansion programs. <clears throat> so, to, yes, sir. I'm sorry, I just want to make sure that I'm clear on this. So everything in the budget is always 100% fully funded, regardless of state money or like Robert Pittman money. Yes, sir. right. Okay. Yeah. So that's, I got you. So to fast forward to the, the end of the presentation here, what I would be requesting today, there's three things. Uh, first is that you'd approve the expansions in the amount of $12.1 million in the current year. Again, of that $12.1 million, 321,000 or less than 3% would be from license dollars. Also in those expansion programs, we would re get a return of 5.7 million that I just mentioned to you a minute ago. And wh while the figure is really always moving in, a, in, a, in, a, in an estimation and sometimes a, an educated guess, I really think that we're going to add money back to our reserve at the end of this fiscal year, at the end of this 18, 19 year. The second thing I would request is that the, the current year expansion to the boating fund, which is $650,000. 500,000 of that is a placeholder, which means it, there's no project identified for it to go to, but the marine fuel tax projects come in all the time and rather than have to come back to you each time and say, you want to expand the budget, what we would do is just come back and say, do you agree with this project? And if you do, then it, it's already in the budget. So $500,000 is a placeholder under the marine fuel tax for projects that we would like to be able to consider during this current year. $150,000 would be for the statewide reservoir fish habitat program that we discussed in last month's meeting at Chattanooga. <clears throat> and finally, the fiscal year 1920, uh, the total agency budget of $93,684,200, of which $80,805,000 is for wildlife programs, which includes $315,000 in improvement projects. Again, the $315,000 above what our ordinary base salary would have, our base programs would have been. So wildlife programs, $80,805,000. And of that $315,000 that we're adding in improvement projects, only 1.7% of that is from license dollars, in other words, 54,000. And we would ask for an approval of $12,879,200 for the boating program with no improvements. Mm -hmm. So we estimate in 1920, 
that we will probably at this particular time, knowing that this is moving target, probably 1.9 million coming from the wildlife reserve and 964,000 coming from the boating reserve. So Mr. Chairman, that's back to you for, I guess, whatever comments or questions. Thank you, director. Are there any questions from uh, anyone on the budget committee? Okay. Well, you, you must have done well. Um, <laughs> at this time, uh, Chairman Cook, the uh, Budget Committee, I guess, would recess. And um, you got something, Brian? I've got a request for a, a budget expansion. Okay. At what's appropriate time. Okay. Now, let's, let's go ahead and put that in. We were approached by the Tennessee S3DA uh, youth archery <clears throat> youth archery program uh, to consider helping fund their program. Uh, the proposal that they've given me, I think everyone's got a copy, was fifty thousand dollars for the first year, and subsequent years for thirty-five thousand eight hundred. Uh, looking at maybe a three-year commitment, possibly if uh, if the commission agrees. Hold that thought. I have just been chastised. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Kurt did it. Kurt did it. <laughs> uh, I have been chastised by my vice chairman. I actually do need a motion on the budget. Uh, so second. Second. Uh, at this point, I can hear the ex. Now we will have discussion on the budget. Yes, please. I'd like to second Commissioner McLaren's motion for the budget expansion. So we have a first and a second. And can you give me those numbers again, please? The uh, first year would be $50,000. And the next two years would be 35800 each. So 50000 first year and then 35800 for the next two years. Correct. So we have a first and a second. Any discussion? All in favor of the... Uh, uh, we do have a question. Yes. Are we able to uh, fund things in three-year blocks like that, or, or is it year by year generally? I understand this is the way the other shooting programs are run. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to clarify. Thanks. Commissioner McLaren, just a question. Um, some of this stuff, just like a trailer or other equipment, what will happen to that if something happens to this organization? They just, you know. I don't know. It's it's a pretty strong organization. Uh, okay. But uh, they had actually asked if we if we might have a surplus trailer or a trailer we weren't using, actually was in their first uh, proposal. But I've been told we probably don't have uh, that availability. Is why we we left the the trailer proposal in there. Okay. Do they, they have other funding? I mean, the uh, the kids pay thirty dollars each to the national organization, and then the rest of their funding that they have comes from putting on these shoots. So if they have a regional shoot, the kids pay between fifteen and twenty dollars to go to the shoot, and the state organization gets a portion of that, maybe five dollars or so to uh, to fund their projects. Watson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I wonder if, since this is related to a budget expansion, we, if if the commission approves this expansion, we certainly would give the uh, autonomy to the agency to negotiate whatever the right agreement would be in terms of an MOU or whatever. If we fund this related to what happens under some sort of circumstance that's unseen, and so. I think that's something that they could certainly do as they negotiate it, but the funding approval um, occur. If that's possible, then I think that might be able to sure. cover both sides of it. Is there a reason we can't do that? Okay. I'll second it if you don't already have one. The amendment. Yeah, she seconded it. I didn't hear you. I'm like Connie. I don't know if you did or not. <laughs> actually, actually, at this point, 
be no other discussion. I'll take a, I'll take a, a, a vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. All right. Mr. Chairman, excuse me. Just for clarification for me, that was an expansion to this year's budget. Okay. Yes, sir. So that means the expansions would now be twelve million eighty five plus what we just did. Yes, sir. Okay. Eighteen nineteen current year. Okay, at this time, uh, Mr. Chairman, we're going to table any further discussions about the budget until tomorrow. Thank you, Chairman Sanders. And it came to my attention that Mr. Young, who spoke earlier, would like to address agent carbon processing. So in order to do so, I feel as though I should turn this back over to Commissioner Woodson for the Fisheries Committee to reopen that committee. We'll open it back up. And Mr. Young, do you have comments? Thank you to the commission for giving me a few minutes here on the Asian cart. And if you don't mind, would you introduce yourself again yes, just so um, we can keep our records straight? Okay. I'm Clay Young. I'm the owner of North American Caviar, and uh, we started processing Asian carp about a year ago. And uh, right now, just to give you a little brief summary, we're, we process about 50, 45 to 50,000 pounds a month of the Asian carp, and we are actually making carp strips out of the Asian carp. And uh, there's a few places. Uh, we've got a contract with a company in California that is gonna st start trying to work with the uh, three of the California school systems that will start making uh, fish sticks, fish, uh, fish patties, and like the uh, fish nuggets and everything. So that's a, that's a good thing coming in, you know, but uh, I just wanted to thank the commission on the seven cents a pound that's coming on. We, you know, that's one of our problems right now is getting enough fishermen to get enough fish to supply all these things and uh, also on the size. Most of your places in Kentucky want the 10 pound and up Asian carp with the carp strips and being able to make the fish patties and stuff, that will let us target like a four pound to 10 pound for just that. So that just a brief thing on that, I appreciate the seven cents a pound and the webbing. We're getting a lot more interest in fishermen, you know, wanting to get into the carp industry, so. Thank yes, you. Has anybody, dis anybody discussed changing the name of the carp? To a nicer, more friendly. That's a great idea. There, yeah. there, there was Listen a to the branding guy. No, there was a salt. There's a saltwater fish. What was it? What was the saltwater fish, Frank? If I may. It's a drum. And, and, okay, there you go. So, wouldn't that be a good idea? It, we actually have a five-star restaurant in San Francisco that is buying four to five thousand pounds of these carp strips a month and they make fish tacos, their salads. Now, I'm not sure what they're calling it, but I'll, I'll find out. But I mean, it's uh, it, It's, it's a big. Thought because it's, yeah. you know, everybody, not everybody, most people I talk to about that is, is this, it, carp is like, ooh, nasty, this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and it's, we ate this stuff when, a couple of years ago and, and it yeah. was really good. Yeah. Just a yeah. thought, thank so. you. All right, thank you. Wait a minute, Clay. Yeah. Is there a place we can buy it somewhere? Retail? Me? We, well, we sell it. Then we need your car. Uh, you know, I, ha I haven't had any interest in Tennessee yet. Uh, we're, we're wanting to get into the school systems in California because I think that could help us maybe work into like the Shelby County schools and some of the others. It's just there's, there's not a huge profit in the Asian carb even, but you get a 10% yield off of an Asian cart when you do strips. So it takes a thousand pounds to get a hundred pounds of strips. Yeah. But there is a machine that is called, and I've been in the process of looking into buy that. It's a machine. It's a bone separator. You basically, you gut the fish, you take the head off, you feed it through this machine. It presses the meat through a screen 
and then it goes into a colander and the uh, the meat comes out like a tuna fish basically and that's what they're going to start making the patties with and stuff but the machines are like fifty thousand dollars to do this so we're looking into that any other questions <laughs> all right yeah the strips i mean we we basically we can i've got two guys that work on them and they they can they can get about 200 250 pounds of strips per day you know off that and then the rest of them are shipped off whole to kentucky so any other questions okay with that right. thank you very much thank you mr chairman thank you chairman woodson I'd like to recognize chairman stroud for the Government Relations Committee. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chair recognized Chris Richardson. Doing well, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for asking. Um, I'm going to try to do a PowerPoint today. As you all know, most of the time I just stand and deliver, and I don't normally have slides. But thanks to uh, some work from our new attorney, Thomas, and also Jason Harmon, I have some slides to try to go through today. Um, this is scheduled in the Government Relations Committee for no other reason probably than it was a recent change by the General Assembly. Uh, but this is somewhat of a departure from our normal process for rulemaking because this is somewhat of a new arena that we're entering. Um, what I'm presenting to you today is not the language of a proposed rule. It's not even really a preview of a rule, but this is a conceptual overview of a, what a rule could look like that we could adopt. Um, this is the first time I'm aware of that the agency has been given the authority to get into the business of regulating businesses. Uh, the General Assembly last session gave the commission the authority to regulate every aspect of a commercial paddlecraft operator's business. Um, this was due to a number of things, uh, but basically to tell you kind of what the problem is, is the, the increased user groups on our waterways, the increased popularity in paddlecraft has led to uh, conflicts between fishermen and recreational paddlers, conflicts between recreational paddlers, private landowners. Uh, there's conflicts at our access ramps. Um, the volume of traffic is, that's going on the river is something that we really haven't experienced or really haven't had to deal with. So, the large portion of the increased traffic, at least by most accounts, on the waterways where we receive the most complaints can be attributable to these commercial operations. Um, obviously, there are a number of uh, privately owned paddlecraft in the state. This, the, the authority that was given to the, the commission and the rules that I'm discussing with you do not impact the private boat owner in any way. This is simply and entirely aimed at these commercial operators. So the problem is the increased traffic. Um, that leads to congested areas. It also leads to an extreme amount of enforcement time that our officers are dedicating to it. Uh, the trespass issues, the water quality issues, litter, the things that we're seeing on the rivers are all things that the General Assembly thought best that we have the rulemaking authority in order to address. We have to try to find a way uh, through rulemaking to allow these businesses obviously to continue to operate. They provide a popular service, but we want to mitigate the conflicts between user groups. We want to promote uh, the protection of the private lands, and we want to ensure that paddlecraft operations continue to contribute or begin to contribute to those waterways that they use. Right now they're making money hand over fist, but they're not really putting much back into the resource financially. This is the actual bill that passed. This is the language that gives you the authority to regulate these commercial operations. Uh, as you'll see uh, by the title of the uh, statute, it is limited to commercial. It does not apply to private vessels. Uh, it's limited to non-motorized vessels. Uh, but a vessel could be anything. If you went down the river on a, in a bathtub, that's your vessel that day. So if we have a livery operator that wants to rent out bathtubs to go down the Harpeth, we can still regulate. Uh, waters of Tennessee mean any waters within the territorial limits of the state. Um, it does not apply to privately owned ponds or lakes not used for commercial purposes. 
There's the, the meat of it. The commission is hereby authorized to establish rules, regulations, permits, and procedures regulating all aspects of commercial operations that lease or rent non-motorized vessels for non-commercial use by the public on the waters of Tennessee. That's pretty broad, um, I will tell you, but it's limited in the sense of who we're talking about. Let's see, backwards. Uh, the, I'll get to that, Commissioner Cox. The second paragraph is a, is a limited exclusion to areas of the state where there already is a significant amount of regulation on the commercial operators, mostly the white water streams that are heavily regulated, the ACOE, um, also uh, some places in the national parks uh, and the national forests. There you go. So what is the first step? And, and this is my conversation my personal opinion along with some conversations that i've had with the agency and also some uh, within the recreational paddling community and the fishing community i think that one problem that we currently have is we just don't have much information when it comes to commercial paddlecraft industries we can all tell anecdotal stories and we know that there, there are operators on the caney fork we know they put a lot of boats out we know that there's tippecanoe on the harpeth and we know they put a lot of boats out but we don't really have a firm grip on how many commercial operators are operating in the state where they're operating how many boats they're operating all of those things so in my mind the first step to this regulation is to to create a general permit uh, that will allow us a method um, through application to develop and gain some of that information that I'm talking about. So I would propose that we would develop a, an application in the form, a, a form application that has to be filled out that we gain some uniform knowledge about all of these um, operations. Uh, additional provisions of the permit. Uh, vessel identification is something that has come up with, particularly with regard to altercations or conflicts that happen on the rivers. Uh, fishermen gets knocked over by a recreational paddler that's rented from a commercial outfit or a uh, private landowner on the river uh, sees someone uh, come up and trespass on their property. They can see the boat. They can't really identify that person. I would propose that we have a system that requires that the vessels leased or rented by the commercial operations to be prominently marked with the name of the business and also a unique identifying number on the boat that can be tracked back to that individual that rented it. Um, Obviously, as we delve off into a new form of regulation, we're going to have increased responsibilities. When we have increased responsibilities, we're going to need increased personnel and or processes for handling this. That's going to require dollars. I would propose that in order to do that, the general permit come along with a fee, and that be an annual fee, much like a commercial fisherman would pay for the license to commercially fish in our state, this would be a fee that uh, the commercial operator would pay annually uh, and that initial fee would be almost would be attributable almost to all the administrative tasks that come along with it whether it be uh, the staff time that it takes to keep track of these the processing of the applications um, and and a few other things that i think the agency uh, would would be involved in that i'll get to in a minute i would also suggest that the commission consider what i'm calling a launch fee and that be every time a commercial operator puts a boat on the water that there be a fee associated with that launching and that money be collected i don't think that would be a large fee i would suggest to you that it would be a nominal fee something similar to perhaps what a one day county of residence fishing license cost or maybe even less than that uh, because these are for trips not necessarily for a whole day but that launch fee uh, would come back to the agency on a monthly basis from the commercial operators, which I would assume they will pass down to the consumer, uh, but that money be used for resource protection. And that could be used in the form of um, increased enforcement or dedicated enforcement officers on the waterways that are being impacted. Uh, obviously could be used to increase access to clean up uh, some of the conflicts that we're having, whether it's expansion of a ramp or perhaps an opening of a new ramp that could be dedicated for commercial activity. Um, then you also could do uh, river cleanups, devote some money back into the actual resource from a water quality or protection standpoint. This is going to require to, to implement any of this, this is going to require pretty good records to be kept by the commercial operator. They would have to maintain records for all trips and the records would have to include that information both from the standpoint that we want to be able to track who was in that boat, but we also need to be able to 
track how many trips they do. If we're going to charge a trip fee, we have to be able to have records that are sufficient to allow us to come in and audit to find out how much money that operator should be remitting to the agency for re resource protection. These are some ideas on things that I think belong in the general permit when it comes to actual operation that we would want to require. They're pretty straightforward. A lot of them come out of, um, I pulled from TDEC permits that are currently regulating some commercial whitewater operators over in southeast Tennessee. Uh, you got to comply with the Department of Safety's rules when transporting passengers on land. These are some of the other places where I think some of the initial administrative fee might come in. Um, I think the agency should produce and provide an information, informational uh, literature and or a video perhaps that they can show prior to launching uh, that talks about things like safety on the river, river etiquette, landowner trespass issues. Uh, I think that that needs to be required in order to address some of the complaints that we've had. And also providing litter sacks to each individual boat. Uh, those are both things that the agency can produce and perhaps provide to the operator as part of that general permit. Uh, and I meant to clean this up. Darren Ryder told me not to use PFD, but to use life jacket. Uh, I think we would require that any commercial operator provide a life jacket for every individual that rents to them. I believe that we should limit individuals under the age of 16 from renting uh, a vessel unless they are accompanied by an adult. All of these uh, potential rules would fall under our general authority well, the specific authority that you have to promulgate these rules comes from the statute I, I outlined. Generally, in our code, Title 69, if you violate a TWA rule, then it is a Class C misdemeanor. So these requirements will become criminal violations. Therefore, if they violate, it would be a Class C misdemeanor. A Class C misdemeanor could result in judicial revocation of the permit immediately and certainly failure to comply with all requirements of the permit could result in us not renewing a permit the following year. That is my basic overview of what the general permit would look like, my suggestions. I'm presenting it to you in this form as a conceptual overview because this is such a new area for us that I want to get your import, input before we even start to draft language. Uh, but in addition to the general permit, I think these are some of the, the future actions that we, we might consider in rulemaking, although not part of the presentation today. I absolutely want to form what I'm calling CPAC, which is the Commercial Paddlecraft Advisory Committee. It needs to have representation both from the fishing community, from the recreational paddling community, from the commercial industry, uh, and it needs to be very uh, well represented on the waterways. I think that there are a lot of issues that might happen on one river that don't necessarily happen on another. And as we get into some of those details to help further the goal of cleaning up some of these conflicts, we may have to consider very specific regulations on an individual river. For instance, the Harpeth River carries very different challenges than the Caney Fork River, if for no other reason than the Caney Fork is a hydroelectrically controlled dam and, and, the, and the Harpeth River is not. So, I mean, the, those water releases on the Caney Fork present different challenges. That's just one example. Um, that is my overview for you today, and I, I hope that you have um, some, some feedback for me. Um, the next kind of the timeline that I'm kind of working off of would be uh, to get a, a rule, language of a rule completed in time to preview uh, to you under our standard process, perhaps in September or October, with a rule before you for actual consideration in December. With that, Mr. Yes. Chairman, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I was going to say, dude, uh, the committee, will you put that together? Yes, sir. Okay. I've already started to solicit potential representation. Um, Mr. Butler at the Wildlife Federation has identified some individuals. There have been some individuals following uh, commercial uh, <clears throat> owners that have been following some of our discussions that have reached out to me. My goal would be to to have representation from all of the major rivers that we're looking at regulating. So somebody from the Caney Fork, somebody from the Elk, um, and not just one person, but kind of those, all of those core areas, which I consider to be yeah, the rec yeah, yeah. recreational paddler, the commercial industry, the fisherman, and the landowner, ideally. Got a question. Yes, sir. 
Chris, I'm just sitting here looking at the canoe. You're talking about a launch field. Right there's two people in the canoe. Uh, up in Cock County, the Pigeon River, Cock County implemented a, it's a, a tax several years ago. Each person that comes down that river pays $2 uh, extra, and that goes to straight into Cock County's budget. Yep, that, and that's somewhat in line with what I'm talking about when I talk about a, uh, a launch fee. Uh, it might be, you could do it per individual, uh, you could do it per boat. Um, I think the record keeping from the livery's perspective is probably going to be, uh, you know, on a canoe, that canoe is going to be rented to one person. They're going to have to keep up with that. I don't, we could certainly require them to name any other passengers and charge it that way. Uh, <coughs> that's all open for discussion. Got one more question. This is for you, Darren. What is the the uh, like on the paddlecraft? The the light rule after dark. You've got to be able to display a light. It can be flashlight or anything. It's just paddlecraft, not under power. You have to be able to display a light. They don't have to have the red and green up front. Just stay no, light. Not okay. Not All right. Thank you. Any non-motorized, by the way, Darren. I'm sorry. Any non-motorized, like a John boat with no boat. Kayak, okay. Whatever. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you, Chris. I really appreciate all that you put in a lot of time on this and really appreciate it. And I know we've been talking about it for a year and a half or two years now. And I'm so thankful to the legislature for granting us this this yeah. authority because, you know, as you said, we, we definitely need this. I hate the word fair, so we'll call it equitable. You know, it's equitable that the folks who are using the room, of course, we want everybody to enjoy it, but the fishermen have to pay their fair share for the for the facilities and I think it's only fair for everyone else as well. So I think it's a great plan, thank you. One other thing to mention in our discussion, we talked about the um, so someone under 16 has to have an adult with them, but you know, like you mentioned, like a Boy Scout troop can have one or two adults. It's not that one adult with each kid, it's just they need some adult supervision with the group. That would certainly be my personal opinion uh, Commissioner Cook, that we just don't want uh, commercial livery to be able to rent to someone under 16 without any uh, adult supervision or accompaniment. But I would not think that it would specifically need to be a one-to-one -one type ratio. Uh, Commissioner Collins. What's your, when will you bring this back for action? Uh, as soon as we are ready and comfortable with the feedback that I get from you all, uh, this is a pretty, I can work some language off of this conceptual overview if there are no changes and probably have that certainly by October. Uh, but the action by the, com that would be timeline to file the rule. The I I my timeline for you to take action on this would be in December, is my goal. Mr. Woods. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one, thank you very much. Uh, this is a really important issue and I appreciate it. Uh, I don't know everybody else does too. Um, the question that I have relates to the advisory committee and just to make sure I'm understanding the purpose of it. There's a concept that they're going to meet through, discuss, improve, perhaps, if there are better ideas, and that that a recommendation would come out of that committee? That's correct. It Perfect. would not be um, near as, it's not going to be formally created like the Commercial Fishing Advisory Council. And from from my perspective, the, the advisory committee um, would not be convened or made up until after we had the general permit in place where we knew who the operators were and the interested parties. Right now, I don't know how to reach all of the commercial liveries and how to get them involved, tell them that this committee might be meeting. So I'm really, this may sound bad, I'm not really looking for a lot of impact input from that group when it comes to the general permit. I'm looking at that group when we start going further and drilling down on waterway specific <clears throat> regulations. Okay, I'm not sure I understand the distinction, but I'll maybe give a preference and then however the process ends up. It seems like the earlier we can get input from these user groups in some sort of formal way, the better, whether it's on the permitting process, whether it's on how it would all go. So just generally, I think that that's a great idea and would hope that that could happen as early in the process or at least as early in the process where there wouldn't be irrevocable decisions that could easily be discussed and refined and improved through a process. So that's one thought. Second wondering I have is for the advisory committee, 
because I don't know exactly how it falls out on each of these subcategories, but like the scenic waterways, waterways leadership, would they be a part of this or I their would, leadership or representatives? Would they be a part of this? I would absolutely hope so. I would I mean, group, I'd group them into the private paddle craft, which we have a representative of the SRA here today, believe it or not. So. Yes, I did believe that. I actually visited earlier with her. Uh, and so I, that makes a lot of sense. I think that would be a great idea. I just didn't know exactly where they would fall into those. So thank you very much. I'm, I, Andrea, I may be misclass, misclassifying where that role would be as, as a private, but, but the private boat owner, private rec boater is where I consider your representation of your organization uh, to be a big part of, of how we go forward. Thank you. Commissioner Sanders. Three things. And uh, one, um, you mentioned misdemeanor. Is that going to be assessed if there is a violation? Is that going to be assessed against the license holder or the clerk that's in there? I've, I've often, and, and I don't need an answer now, but just something to consider. I've often marveled at the uh, when the beer boards enforce their rules against the people that violate it, not just the license holder it seems to get their attention a little more we might need to consider having a designated representative on the application or sure. something of that nature to know where that would uh, go uh, is this and this applies to all commercial applications because i know uh, where i'm at um, i don't know if they rent a lot of kayaks and stuff they run a heck of a lot of paddle boards yep. so anybody that is in the commercial business and then finally is I guess how's how's the enforcement planned for? I know that you rented out a hundred paddle boards this week. How are we going to be able to to follow up on that? Uh, something to consider. Yes, sir. Certainly, that that's something we're we're continuing to discuss, but without uh, revealing any of what Ellie's plans might be and telling people how we're going to enforce it. Um, I, I think that there are some thoughts, and I think it's possible. Sure. Uh, I think okay. they can do it. Any other questions? Do I ask about the public? Does anybody have any questions? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Yes, please. Be sure and say your name and all Absolutely. the stuff. Yes, sir. I'm Andrea White. I'm a board member for the Tennessee Scenic Rivers Association. Um, we are a membership-driven 501c3 nonprofit with a 52-year history as a conservation organization with a definitive paddling problem. We are run by a bunch of crazy kayakers and canoeists, and we raise money for, for the environment and for conservation by offering training. Um, we do a, I, I personally organize nine recreational paddler classes um, this year, and we had another six that were for whitewater, uh, in addition to the training we did for first responders. So we train everyone from the most casual paddler to first responders and everything in between. Um, I also have the honor of being here today on behalf of several other major paddling clubs in the state. The Tennessee Valley Canoe Club out of Chattanooga, Choda out of Knoxville, the Appalachian Paddling Enthusiast out of Upper East Tennessee, and the Bluff City Canoe Club out of West Tennessee. Each of these organizations is also full of nationally certified instructors just like we are that are offering the same kind of training in their regions and on their rivers. We are on the front lines of what's happening here. And if there's anything, not just this, but anything TWRA wants to do with regard to paddlecraft, we would love to be a resource for you collectively. Um, we are here to help. We are on the front lines. The only other thing I would say, and we've got time, we're put, getting together with Chris later to talk more specifically. Um, the only other thing I would say is that there's a safety issue with kayaking going on right now, with the explosion of kayaking going on in our state. There have been five recreational paddler and kayak angler deaths on class one and lakes this year in Tennessee. These are not what we consider the dangerous waters in our state. There have been zero paddler deaths on whitewater. We have destination class three, four, and five whitewater rivers in the state that people come from the entire region, in some cases the world, to paddle. Um, that's not where we have a safety issue. We have a safety issue on what people perceive as easy water. And we've got five paddle clubs across the state that are doing everything we can with as many volunteer hours as we can muster to try to address it. We would love to partner with you. That's great. Thank you so much. Any questions? Yeah, comments? Jeff? So, you know, we don't have the authority to do this, but you certainly maybe can speak for your organization and the other organizations around the state. 
uh, if this is a legislative issue, but back to the equity issue, mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, we, we ask motorboats to be registered and, you know, because they use the ramps, they use the parking lots, they, if they get in trouble, they need to be rescued by law enforcement. What, what do you think your organization and other organizations would think of, of asking for kayaks to be, or paddlecraft to be registered and have a, a, a nominal fee to help support all those issues, the boat ramps, the park, and the law enforcement? I can tell you right now, I, I am not in authority to speak for any organization other than mine. Uh, and my board has not come down with a position on this issue either. So I don't want to overstep my role as a spokesperson for any of these organizations. Uh, I know that this has happened in other states. There is some awareness, particularly among these avid enthusiasts, about this possibility. There is some uh, fear about how that would be implemented. And that's part of a conversation that if that is coming down the pike, we want to be in that conversation and make sure it's done equitably. So I'm not hearing no. Uh, um, Thank you. That's I'm enough. Gonna, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. I've been around a lot of campfire conversations and board meetings that would have very negative feelings toward that proposal. <laughs> but the answer to your question is that we want to be a part of the solution. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I, again, it's just the equity issue that that, uh, that I think is important to consider. So thank you very much. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Thank you so much. I've got a question. Right? Stupidity here again. So she offers, you offer, your people offer all these really good uh, classes. Mm -hmm. Probably saves a lot of lives and stuff. I so, love being able to hear the routine stories about our students who are saving other people. Wonderful. So in this discussion that we're having um, and, you know, her work that she does, uh, it, I know we can't, as of right now, unless somebody tells me different, you can't require somebody to take a class before you, okay, that's not our job. But is there a way or can we look at these uh, license holders, the, the, the delivery guys, right, that they have to take a class or that they have to be educated or that they're responsible uh, for what they're, well, the business that they're doing? I know they have insurance. I mean, I'm sure that if that happens. I'm sure that they could, um, I'm not sure, but I would imagine that if they were more uh, trained, well trained in their personnel, well trained, so forth, so that their insurance would look kindly on them a little bit more as far as rates and that kind of thing. So it, it certainly could be a requirement of the uh, permit for operation of a commercial of a commercial operator if you right. chose to put some yep. training requirements on right. uh, those employees that certainly it would be within the purview of the legislation Jeff owns a kayak business and we we can require him to take that that uh, that class absolutely as 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 a TWRA okay Ma'am, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Well, Keep up we, the good I, work. I, I offer you collectively these five organizations as a resource for anything you all are doing across the state. Thank you. It looks like there's a lot of really good stuff getting ready to happen for that. Yes, sir. To follow up, um, can we expand the boater safety class that's required to cover paddlecraft? No. I, I don't. I don't know the the. Not without a sausage making change. of that. Okay. But it would require that is limited to the operation of motorized vessels in the code. And what we're talking about I, is just from, commercial. Sorry. No, I'm just making sure that I was saying that correctly. Tracy is my. So that back. that is that is legislatively. To mandate say a safety course for um, non motorized vessels would be a legislative change. Well, having one of the the five deaths in my backyard just a few weeks ago on flat water uh, it's definitely something yeah. I see a lot of um, careless and ignorant things yeah. and ignorance is not bad it's a lack of education so maybe we can look at ways to expand now, that. now certainly with regard to the commercial leasing or renting we can require some safety orientation or safety course to happen before launching in that commercial uh, that arena yeah. Which they need training for, but I, but I think we're all headed down the same yeah. path here. Yeah, they yeah, need Mark, to be more responsible. They need to educate more. They need to be educated more. I agree, but, but my concern is is the commercial side is is a very small number yeah. of the people out there paddling around on yeah. flat water, yeah. flipping their kayaks. Baby so. steps. 
Yeah. Any other questions? Any other comments? Chris, great, man. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know Chairman. you're doing a ton of work here, and I appreciate it. Appreciate y'all very much. Be sure and hang on to that baby now. Don't mess up. I'll do it, sir. Thank you. <laughs> We're done on my side. Thank you, Chairman Stroud. And I'd like to, again, thank the agency for all the hard work. I know we went from wildlife season setting, and that takes a lot of folks, but the budget takes everybody. It involves the, the entire agency. So thanks so much for preparing this. Any other comments from the commission? Well, with that, we are adjourned until tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Thank you.